Hello. <laughs> Can everybody hear me okay? I changed it up from the practice yesterday. I decided I couldn't stand on that nice rug. Uh, so my name is Jennifer Frazier, and I'm a scientist at the Exploratorium, which is a museum in San Francisco. And today I'm going to be talking about creating new genres of museum exhibits with scientific visualization. So since we are saying we're talking about things outside of school, I don't have a picture of a classroom, but I do have a picture of a museum. <laughs> So I just wanted to remind everyone that museums have long been places where we can go to see things that we can't normally see. We can stand under a fossilized brontosaurus skeleton. We can look through a telescope to look at the rings of Saturn. We can control the same microscopes that scientists do to look at things like fertilization or embryonic stem cells. Tens of millions of people a year come to museums and it might be because they're on field trips or maybe they're looking for something to do with the grandparents. But I think it's because it's one of the only places, especially people out of school, can interact with real objects, phenomena, and tools of science. But the tools that I want to talk about today are not the iconic microscopes and telescopes that we think of so often. I want to talk about visualizations. Um, and I'm not going to get into the hotly debated definitions of visualizations. I'm going to show you some examples. And what I want to focus on are that visualizations are critical to the scientific process. So they're used by scientists to record and communicate their observations, like Galileo's uh, observations through his telescopes of the phases of the moon. They're used to synthesize data. So here's an image of Watson and Crick building a physical model. And it was the actual construction of this model that led to the, their solving the structure of DNA. Visualizations are also used to find patterns or see new phenomena. So here's the, the echo simulation uh, where they've taken buoy and satellite data and are seeing sort of new things about the global ocean circulation. So visualizations are a critical tool, but they're becoming increasingly critical in the era of big data <laughs> and massive data sets. So I, I had a, a much larger collection of things because now it's not just limited to the scientific journals. Now that's like Wired and Scientific American, but I tried to keep this very serious. So uh, now that we're in this era of big data, visualizations are even more critical because they're one of the ways that scientists are making discoveries with these big data sets. They have to visualize them. So what, is a, what about museums? How are museums taking advantage of this dramatic increase in the number of scientific visualizations? Well, there are a lot of opportunities visualizations afford our environments. They're visually stunning, like this sort of journey through a plant cell in a planetarium show at the California Academy of Sciences. Uh, they help us explore unfamiliar size scale or current topics in science, and this is a Vi scientific visualization of atoms in a nanotechnology exhibition at the Science Museum in London. And because they're digital, they can be used on novel interfaces. And this is probably one of the best known examples. It's NOAA's Science on a Sphere, which is now in over 200 sites around the world. And you can see Queen Elizabeth enjoying Science on a Sphere. <laughs> so, so they're really for everybody. We're really reaching out to the community with, with these <laughs> visualizations. But I think one of the things that I wanted to focus on is we're really taking advantage of visualizations to inspire, to engage, and really to transfer some of the stories of current science. But as I mentioned a few minutes ago, communicating is really only one of the functions of visualization. And one of the things I think that our field is just starting to explore is how do we take advantage of those other functions visualizations perform in science? Visualizations are discovery tools. Scientists use them to ask and answer questions, make observations, they can be very active, so why is it that we're only using them as ways of communicating? Um, so the question really becomes, can we let people in museums use visualizations the same way scientists do, or can we build visualization tools visitors can use to make their own discoveries? Of course, I think the answer is yes, or I wouldn't be here today. And I wanted to talk about a few case studies from the field. Um, of course, starting with my own. <laughs> So uh, the project that is you know, near and dear to my heart is called Living Liquid, and this is at the Exploratorium, but it's in partnership with the Visualization Interface and Design Innovation Group at UC Davis and the Darwin Project at MIT. And we're building a huge building with, no, I'm just kidding. So this, the, the reason I put this picture of the building is sort of to set context. We didn't get quite that much money from the NSF and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. 
but I wanted to set context that we are going to be moving to this new location over San Francisco Bay. And as one of the curators of the Life Sciences Gallery, I was really interested in how can we adapt these new visualization tools that scientists are using to study ocean life into something for visitors. And you might look at that and think, what, what life is in this picture exactly? Uh, well, the life here in these sort of swirls are plankton. So plankton are microscopic sea creatures uh, that are, can be found in almost every drop of seawater. I think that they're deserving of at least 10 minutes on their own, but for the purposes <laughs> of today, I will only say that they are the basis of the marine ecosystem and central to Earth's climate, and you'd be dead without them. <laughs> so that's it for plankton. But um, the reason that they're globally important, they have to be studied on this global scale, they can't just be studied in a drop of seawater, so we need global models. And one of the sort of leading models for studying plankton dynamics is the Darwin Project at MIT. And this is a supercomputer-based simulation where they're mo you know, basically taking all sorts of data so that they can model things about plankton. How many are there? Where do different types live? How do they change in response to the environment? So there's something, it's a model used by like dozens of researchers to address really fundamental questions about these microscopic creatures that I adore. Um, here is one output from that model. So this was produced by the Darwin Project, and it's showing the distribution of four major plankton groups, represented by red, yellow, turquoise, and green. Um, and because you didn't get a lecture on plankton, we're just going to call them red, yellow, turquoise, and green. But even if you look at the, you know, their output of their simulation, you can really start to see there's some very blatant patterns. Oh, the red stuff, is it both the poles? Why is it that the turquoise flows along the equator? some extremely deep questions, even from looking at this. And we wrote an NSF, well, we have an NSF Pathways grant that was really focused on exploring, can we adapt a visualization tool like this into something that can be used by visitors to ask and answer their own questions? So six months, one computer scientist in residence, four trips to MIT, and 90 visitor interviews later, uh, this is a, basically a, a screenshot of what we have on a a touch screen, it's a prototype, and I can't really control the movie, so I'll just try to walk you through it a little bit. The, the first thing I wanted to point out is that we used a lot of prior work in visualization research and both formal and informal education to change sort of even the way the basic visualization was displayed, so the colors, the speed of the current, saturation, so we changed the underlying movie. But the thing you're probably all sort of noticing is that then we also added this completely new representation. And these are these, I mean, I'll call them plankton viewers. And for now, visitors do it with their finger. But on the final exhibit, it'll be something like a lens. And what this viewer is, it sort of serves two purposes. The first was, you know, one thing we knew from reading papers from people like Danny Edelson is that helping bridge the novice, you know, they walk up, they don't know the same thing an expert knows. When they see a giant swirling rainbow globe, who knows what they're thinking. And at least we have now found through evaluation when visitors come up and see these viewers combined with a label, they now know, oh, look, there's little microscopic things. Here's sea life. We're providing them some of the prior knowledge that the experts would have when using the simulation. The second uh, purpose that, that these plankton viewers provide is that they're actually giving visitors much deeper access to the data in this simulation. So in any point, and this is why it's great to have a computer scientist, the, at any point in the simulation, you know, they have all the data. What species are living there? How many are there for any single point on the globe? And what we did is, well, we, being Isaac Liao at, at the University of California, Davis, wrote an algorithm where he, uh, I was checking my time, <laughs> um, we can basically transform the underlying data into representations that are more easily understandable for visitors. So we take what's in the simulation and found which species those represented. And when the visitor moves the viewer around, it's showing the actual species in the right relative amounts. So when we've been testing this prototype to decide, you know, are we going forward with this exhibit, um, we've been really excited to find that visitors are doing what we hoped. They're seeing patterns. They're asking really, they're not just saying, oh, well, yeah, there's purple at the top and the bottom. It's things like, wow, are there the same kinds of things living in the purple at both the North and South Pole? Oh, wait, these things look a lot bigger and juicier. It would actually be crunchy because they're glass. Is that why there are all the whales there on the Discovery Channel? So 
people really are starting to dig into this and ask and answer some of the, some of their own questions. So we're going to be building that into a full exhibit thanks to the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. And I wanted to briefly mention two other examples in our field, since I have 10 minutes. Um, one is the rain table, and this is an effort led by Pat Hamilton at the Science Museum of Minnesota uh, with the National Center for Earth Surface Dynamics and the Electronic Visualization Laboratory at uh, the University of Illinois, Chicago. It's a platform, an interactive platform, where uh, basically visitors can move a cloud around and make it rain. This is not a scientific visualization used by scientists, but as part of another new grant from NSF, this is a scientific visualization being done by Man Liang at University of Minnesota where she's simulating when you break a levee in the Mississippi River Delta, the silt spilling out forms new land. And they're gonna be building a large table where visitors will be able to remove and add levees to see how that might affect estuary formation at the mouth of the Mississippi River. So a real tool being adapted into a visitor experience. Another project is Lake Visualization 3D, which involves five groups of museums, universities, the Institute for Learning Innovation, and Sherry Shi is one of the PIs on this project. And in this project, they're adapting three-dimensional visualizations used by geoscientists and others to study processes in lakes and adapt them so that visitors can control and explore them. So briefly, you know, what does it take, even from three examples, and I'm sure there are many more, some themes begin to emerge. Um, you can't just, if, especially if you're creating a tool, you can't just throw up a visualization on a wall or put something on a screen. There's no one there to explain it. Um, so there has to be actually a lot of cre uh, act creating from scratch or redesigning these visualizations for learners. It requires a lot of collaboration. I've mentioned lots of the various players and a lot of educational research, both understanding the prior work and doing a lot of testing to make sure what you're making is working for people. Why do I think it's worthwhile? That does sound challenging. I'm sure everything people have done here, even if it looks as simple as a origami crane flapping its wings, uh, everything everyone's doing here is challenging, but I think this is definitely worth the challenge because everybody wins. I was gonna put a casino image in at the last minute, but I thought that might be a bad idea. So, you know, the public gets a new way of discovering the natural world, museums get new genres of exhibits, and an unexpected finding for us that's been really exciting is that the visualization researchers and scientists that we're working with are actually gaining a lot of new knowledge and skills. It's not this one-way conduit where they're giving us the stuff and we give it to the public. They are learning things from us because the museum is kind of this common ground where we can bring together these different groups of people sort of toward a common goal. And as an example, the Darwin Project is now thinking of incorporating our viewer into the visualizations they use with scientists. So my time is up, but I would put out the call for building visualization tools for people to make their own discoveries. Thanks.